Okay, we are live. We are here with Alexander Mercurius in London and the one and only Mr. Wilmer Leon. How are you doing, Wilmer? Great to have you back. Thank you. It's an honor truly to have been invited back. Thank you. Thank you both. Fantastic. It is great to have Wilmer with us again. It is great to have Alexander with us. It is great to see our moderators as well. Thank you to Thanks, our sir. moderators in the chat. Zariel is in the house. <clears throat> Zariel, who else is uh, moderating? Is it just me and you today? Zariel, I think it is for now. Mm -hmm. Let me just do a quick right. check. Hello to everyone that's watching us on Rockfin, on Odyssey, Rumble, YouTube, and the Duran.locals.com. And hello to everyone that's joining us on Telegram as well. Great to have everyone with us. Let's, uh, Reckless Abandon is also with us. How are you doing, Reckless Abandon? Mm -hmm. Let's get started and let's talk about uh, Nord Stream. Maybe we could talk about what's happening in, in Ohio and, uh, and all the press that these two stories are getting, which is pretty much none. And I guess all the focus is on balloons. But I pass it mm -hmm. off to, to you, Alexander, to Wilmer, and let's, let's get moving. Well, indeed, you said, uh, uh, you know, the, the media isn't covering certain stories in Britain. You know, go to The Guardian, go to the BBC, you know, Seymour Hirsch, who's he? <laughs> Never heard of him. I mean, it's, it's, it's really extraordinary. It is one of the most bizarre situations I've ever seen. I'm going to make a number of points. Um, um, Alex and I were doing a program yesterday, in which Alex said that the Hirsch article is having more of an effect than people are admitting or talking about. And I absolutely agree with this. And I think over the last 24 hours since we made that programme, I think we've seen more proof. Because I think we've seen over the last couple of hours more concerns expressed by more people that things are going on around the world which are becoming increasingly important. And at the same time, the focus of the administration, of the US government, of the parts of the bureaucracy, the US bureaucracy that they control, remain absolutely obsessively fixed on this one issue, which is Ukraine, where they're prepared to take extraordinary risks and where there's more and more sense that they're losing. Now, there's that extraordinary speech from Stoltenberg yesterday, the NATO Secretary General. He basically admitted we can't supply Ukraine with ammunition. But of course, we're going to find some clever means to do it in time. We're going to you know, come up with some sort of plan. We have an article today in Politico which says that the United States can't supply its attackers missiles because it actually doesn't have enough of them. It would quickly run out of them if it did so. So you have those articles. You have articles from the New York Times saying that the that um, the Ukrainians are about to abandon Bakhmut this time. We've all been hearing so much about. And then you have the other side. We have the administration. We have people from the administration saying that Ukraine should fight more aggressively. And we're getting that in the Washington Post contradicting what the Pentagon was telling Ukraine just a few weeks ago. That they should slow down, not launch counteroffensives now. And we also have a decision that's apparently coming. The administration is apparently planning to release more oil from its strategic reserves. Russia is going to cut back production by half a million barrels uh, um, um, a, a day, uh, a month. So the United States is going to release 26 million barrels of oil from its strategic reserve, presumably to counter and erase the Russian cup, despite the fact that that strategic reserve is running out. Meanwhile, all sorts of things are going on. Britain is in recession. Germany is in recession. Belgium's in recession. Finland is in recession. The United States probably is heading for recession. All the indications suggest that. We have a gathering crisis in the Far East. We have, uh, uh, with, with China, all kinds of problems with China. We've had some very powerful articles and editorials from China, which I've 
circulated amongst the three of us. We've had problems in East Africa, Russians building a base in Sudan, and that's strange story. Um, by the way, I'm not sure I even approve of the fact that they're building a base in Sudan, but that's what they're doing. We have problems in the Palestinian territories. We're having all kinds of things going on. But the focus is first on Ukraine and, of course, on balloons, <laughs> shooting down balloons. So, I mean, Wilma, do, do you agree with me? You know, first, real so growing signs of disquiet but at the same time, an obsessive focus on trying to keep things narrowly directed towards Ukraine. Yes, I, I, I agree with you a thousand percent. And there's a real attempt uh, by the Western press, particularly coming out of the United States, to control the narrative, to distract folks away from what's really going on. Uh, when, when, when you call a war, as the United States has in Ukraine, and then you have to admit, I don't have enough bullets and I don't have enough missiles, you've, you've really got a problem, especially when that war is being fought so far away from your own shores and your opponent is Russia. Uh, that's a big problem. Um, Sun Tzu, there, there are two Sun Tzu quotes that come to mind. One is, the wise warrior avoids the battle. And uh, the other one is, victorious warriors win first, then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. And it's that latter that really jumps out at me because what the United States seems to be seems to do is get into tactical conflicts without strategy. And so we're left kind of throwing up our hands, asking ourselves, well, why are we doing this? What's the what's the what's the objective here? How do you define when? Uh, you know, all of these, these are all questions. I think if you ask Joe Biden that question today, he, or those questions today, he would have absolutely no answer other than Vladimir Putin has to leave Russia, which, you know, <laughs> good luck with that one. Um, so, so there really seems, that distraction seems to be, the, the 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 tactic of the day and final point to to you know just about everything that you articulated alexander could be resolved if the united states just sat down and actually spoke to people and respected the people that it was speaking to listened to them and uh tried to tried to find commonality and solutions but when you're uh, as they say, uh, uh, when your only uh, solution is a hammer, every problem is a nail. And, 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 and so all the United States has or seems to have in its, in its, in its, uh, in its bag is conflict, not, uh, not solution. You know, it's interesting you said that. Do they have a plan? Because today there was a letter to the Daily Telegraph from somebody who I suspect is fairly important, but he makes exactly that point. The title of the letter is, Does NATO have a viable strategy in Ukraine? <laughs> I mean, that's that's already starting to appear in the you know in the British media. And then we have Gideon Rahman, who is an absolutely ardent neocon, and he's now in the Financial Times, he's sounding incredibly defensive. He's his article yesterday, it makes no sense to blame the West for the Ukraine war. <laughs> now, when somebody says that, it tells you that, you know, people are now starting to make, to point the finger of blame, that the recrimination game has begun. And, you know, this is, this is now spiralling out of control. And these people are both getting, are on the defensive, and at the same time, they're prepared to continue with this. I, th I think this policy 
is beginning to look a bit obsessive to me. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what do you make of this? I mean, you know, um, bear in mind that, you know, America produced the best novel on obsession, Moby Dick. I mean, was it did, to the last I grapple with me from hell's heart, I stab at thee, for hate's sake, I spit my last breath at thee. It seems almost as if this is the kind of situation that this administration is leading the U.S. into. Well, I, I think the, the 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 NATO question, the, the the problem that I have with the with the NATO question that you that you mm -hmm. that you raised or posed is I I see a flaw in the premise, and mm -hmm. for to me the premise of that question is that NATO is an independent operation, and it is not. Uh, I mean, I, I get the point of the I get the point of the question, and the point of the question I think is quite apt. But the the, the premise of the question is though that there are people uh, that in NATO that actually are operating as though NATO is an independent entity, and it is not. It is merely the extortion racket that the United States imposes upon the world, and it is kind of the the, the 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 rationale that the United States uses to to impose it, to impose its hegemony on Europe, and and now it's trying to impose it, impose its hegemony on Asia. They want to now put together an, an Asian NATO, uh, and, and that makes absolutely no sense. Mm -hmm. So, where are we going? What is going on in the world? Let's you know try and enlarge it and discuss what's actually happening in the world. The Iranian president is going to China, meeting with Xi Jinping. There's going to be discussions there. Uh, the Iranians are also doing big deals with the Russians. Xi Jinping himself is due to visit Moscow. We don't know the date, but it's widely reported that it'll probably be sometime in March. Xi Jinping had a very successful visit to Saudi Arabia a few weeks ago. Um, there's talk that the Saudis and the Iranians are quietly trying to talk to each other. They're, we don't know very much about what's going on on that front. What's going on in the world? What seems to, very simply put, I think what, what seems to be going on in the world is most of the world now is uniting in order to defend itself against the uh, militarism and uh, ongoing imperialism of the United States. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting when you when you listen to or when you read the speech or speeches from President Xi, when you listen to what President Raisi is saying, they, they both use a word that we used at the opening of this conversation, and that is strategy. Mm -hmm. Their mm -hmm. relationships are strategic. And I think that that is a very, very important point. Uh, uh, again, it's it's strategy first, then tactics. And when you listen to President Putin, he's saying the same thing. My relationship mm -hmm. with China is a strategic relationship. And they also mm -hmm. talk about the long-term interest and the long-term nature of these uh, relationships. And it's also important, I think, to understand the dynamics of their cultures and their history. And we're talking about thousands of years of history versus a couple of hundred for the United States. Mm -hmm. So you, you have incredibly intelligent individuals that come from cultures with incredibly long histories. So mm -hmm. they have a different arc of, per of perspective and perception than the United States does. And, and so whether it's Venezuela and Iran, or if you look at what's happening in the global South with, with Lula uh, and what's happening in, in Nicaragua, I mean, the, 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 chess, the pieces on the chessboard are being rearranged. And the United States in this chess game, in this three-dimensional chess game, is barely playing checkers. Mm. And it's and, and it's the media that I think is really mm. facilitating this on behalf mm. of the West, because if Americans really understood what's going on and why, I think people mm. in this country would be in an uproar. 
I agree with that completely. Tell me what you'd make of the situation, the internal situation in the United States, because I suspect it's going to start to change actually fairly radically, fairly soon. We had this very interesting State of the Union address from the president in which he spoke as little as he could get away with, in my opinion, about foreign policy. <laughs> he had difficulty keeping his temper at one point, I noticed, when he was talking about Xi Jinping. But, you know, generally he said very little. He did repeat the usual neocon talking points. He said that we'll support Ukraine as long as it takes. That effective was what he said. He said that with China, we will work with the Chinese where it's in our interest. <laughs> compete with them on everything else, which is, you know, the Chinese have repeatedly said that isn't, that doesn't take us anywhere. We can't work with the US on that basis, but he repeated those things. But then he came up with a great grand plan for the United States. It all looked, inc I have to say, I mean, there was a lot of people who said this was a great speech by him, his best speech since he became president. I found it incredibly vague and formless. I found that, you know, if you're talking about a plan for changing the United States, it was so sketchy and in so many places so contradictory and so lacking in, you know, what I would call precise detail, the sort of engineering of something that, you know, if, if you're going to really do anything like the kind of changes that you he was talking about that. I mean, it looked to me read more like a wish list, actually, than a plan. And I'm not even sure that he really actually does wish to achieve many of the things that he's talking about. I mean, he's not really done very much to advance mm -hmm. some of them since he became president. So I, I think we have this, you know, this grandiose talk, this great speech, which, as I said, I think means a lot less than it seems or it is intended to seem. I think we have this very narrow group within the White House who are basically and the State Department who are very focused on certain certain specific issues. I think we have an opposition, but it's still very disorganized. Some opposition on the right, very little, but a little amount of opposition now coming, appearing on the left, and a probable recession on the horizon. What is the mood in the United States? What is the state of things in the United States at the moment? Do you agree with my opinion on his State of the Union address? I do. I, I, I think it was a very good speech for what it was. Mm -hmm. It was well, it was performance art. It was kabuki. It was, it, so in that context, it was, it was very well done. Uh, mm -hmm. In the in the words of that famous African American philosopher James Brown, he was talking loud and saying nothing. Um, but so so for what it was supposed to be, it was well done. But it, it was all sizzle and no steak. There was there was nothing there. Uh, you mentioned the neocon talking points. Joe Biden is a neocon, and so. Uh, one of the one of the fallacies is this um, remaining uh, uh, thought that there are actually two parties in the United States. Uh, the stereotype that there are two parties in in the United States, and that Joe Biden repre represents one side of the argument or one side of the aisle, and that the neocons are the other side of the aisle, and nothing could be further. From the truth, hence uh, this 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 horrific blood, as as Dr. King said, blood sucking um, uh, military industrial complex that is draining all of these resources out of our economy, sending them to Ukraine, while trains blow up in Ohio and people live under bridges in Oakland, California, and from Oakland, California to to, to New York City. Joe Biden, it was very interesting. One of the things about him is he obviously knows what to do because he knows what to say. The When you listen, go back to the 2020 election and you listen to his stump speeches, he knew the buttons to push. He knew the things that would 
positively resonate with the electorate, talking about school tuition, talking about health care, talking about child care, uh, all of these very populist ideas that are definitely needed in the United States. But once he was elected with a Democrat-controlled House and a Democrat-controlled Senate, couldn't get the stuff through because he didn't fight for those things. He said in September, last September, that he wanted to be the most pro-labor president in the history of the United States. And then when you have the uh, labor battle between the railroad workers and the and the railway companies, Joe Biden sides with the industrialists. He doesn't side with the workers. So he knows what to say, and he also knows uh, what, what not to do. Uh, you're right about there was very, very little, I think it was 50 minutes, almost 50 minutes before we got to a, um, a, a, a foreign policy discussion, and that was seriously devoid of substance. Uh, America is afraid. Americans are afraid. They are, they are looking at the horizon. The light at the end of the tunnel is an oncoming train. And uh, and and they are Americans are truly frightened. Let me let me throw one more thing in about this so I don't forget it. And that is it's in, when you look at the Republican response to the speech, Sarah Huckabee Sanders is the spokesperson for the Republican Party. That was utter dribble, foolishness and confusion. She is speaking on behalf of the Republican Party, and she's saying that the Republican Party needs new leadership. I don't think Mitch McConnell, I don't think Lindsey Graham uh, appreciated uh, that part of her comment. And what that demonstrated to me is you've got really dissension within the Republican Party. You have the likes of Nikki Haley, who was a Trump person. You've got Ron DeSantis, Trumpian, uh, vying for the Republican nomination. You've got Donald Trump trying to carve out his space. And he's talking about, we don't need to be in Ukraine. Social security should be off the table. He sounded more left than the left. And then I think Sarah Huckabee Sanders has visions of grandeur of her own and she's trying to carve out space for herself and she doesn't know where she fits because she doesn't know what she's doing. Mm, exactly. And let's come back to the media because of course we now have had this enormous story about the fact that the president of the United States and his inner foreign policy team carried out an armed attack on the energy infrastructure of one of the United States' principal NATO allies. And, well, it's not been reported hardly at all here in Britain. I've seen some sketchy reports about it in Germany. Apparently there's been a few reports in Germany, but nowhere near to the extent that you'd expect a story of this importance. Um, it's the United States complete silence. There's been a rail derailment in Ohio, hardly, hardly news. There's all these problems that you've been talking about in the United States, things that concern people in the United States. Media isn't covering them. But for me, it still remains, Nord Stream 2 still remains the most important because two things. Firstly, this is a decision by this tiny group to launch this armed attack on behalf of the United States. They kept the decision making to themselves. They didn't consult widely. They don't seem to have included the vice president in those discussions. They didn't inform Congress. Congress was not informed. And yet the media, total silence about this. Well, the media wasn't informed and that was by design. They went strictly with Navy divers instead of going with America's Special Operations Command, because if they use the Special Ops Command, that requires a report to Congress, and they have to brief the Senate and the House leadership, the Gang of Eight. So they made a strategic decision to circumvent the requirements of Congress and strictly go 
with Navy divers. And I think it's important for people to understand the names that are involved here. Uh, Jake Sullivan, Tony Blinken, Victoria Newland. These are the individuals that were involved uh, in this uh, in this clandestine, uh, just dangerous act of terrorism. And that's what this was, an act of war, an act of terror. And it's really ironic that this Balt Ops 22, uh, this, this, this joint, I think, what is it, 16 NATO member uh, uh, operation in the Baltic Sea that was there to help coordinate uh, uh, responses by all of these countries. The purpose of Balt Ops 22 is to prepare these NATO countries to be able to collectively respond in case of threat. And what did the United States do? It used that operation to threaten the NATO countries. I mean, when you folks have to really understand the hypocrisy and the 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 the, the sheer the sheer I, I don't know I don't, I don't even have a word for it. No, um, I know. Uh, as as Joe Biden months before stood next to Olaf Scholz when asked the question, what are you going to do about Nord Stream? Oh, don't worry about that. That's not going to happen. We're not going to allow that to happen. And people just chuckled like, Mr. President, really? It's not even an American pipeline. Oh, trust me, not going to happen. And then Victoria Nuland is on tape laughing minutes after the pipeline is blown up saying, well, it's now just a big hunk of metal at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm. <laughs> go ahead, man. I, I don't, I don't know. Well, Wilbur, Wilbur, you I, I agree. I agree with absolutely everything you've said. I, I think you're completely right. I'm saying that you're saying that Alex is saying that. We had a few interview with Jeffrey Sachs on Friday. Mm -hmm. He said some of the same things. Why isn't the media in the United States saying this? Why isn't the media discussing the very points that you've just made? Why aren't they asking, for example, why aren't they putting Seymour Hirsch in the television studios? And maybe, you know, they don't agree with him. You say that, you know, Seymour, you've got it all wrong. You've got Mr. Hirsch, you, you, you're, you're, you know, you, you, you've, you've lost it. You've been spun a yarn. You've fabricated it all. Why don't they ask him real tough? questions be very aggressive with Seymour Hirsch after all these are shall we say very serious matters indeed somebody blew up that pipeline the Washington Post tells us the investigators doubt it was the Russians the Germans say they doubt it was the Russians so we got all the facts that tell us to take what Seymour Hirsch is saying extremely seriously why isn't the media covering it? Why aren't they asking the questions? Why aren't they coming after the White House? Why aren't they coming after the State Department? Why aren't they talking to the Defense Department? Why aren't they talking to Hirsch himself? Your, your statement that somebody blew up the pipeline may, takes me back to uh, the, the former uh, poet laureate of New Jersey, the late great Amiri Baraka in his poem, Somebody Blew Up America. Um, the media, unfortunately, has become the stenographer for the capitalist state, for the intelligence state. And so independent journalism has gone the way of Seymour Hirsch. And so, you know, I learned in law school, you never ask, when in court, you never ask the questions you don't know the answer to, and you never ask a question you don't want an answer to. And so the, the reason why uh, the likes of MSNBC CIA is not having Seymour Hirsch on is because they have no rebuttal for him. It, 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 it would become, it would become, uh, like it's a pea shooter at a gunfight. They, they would be bringing a pea shooter to a gunfight. 
Uh, well, Mr. Hirsch, you, you, you say that this meeting took place in the executive office of the president on this date. Uh, it didn't happen. Oh, it didn't? Well, I know that logs are kept in those, when you go into the executive office of the president, which is right next to the White House, you have to sign in. When you, when you, when you want to use a particular room, you have to sign the room out, and the people that go into the room have to sign in. Let's look at the logs. Of, 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 of ingress and egress of, in terms of, the, you know, he has so much evidence to, we know Seymour Hirsch, we know how he operates, we know he doesn't just throw things out there on a whim, that he is a true investigative journalist. And so he has this reputation that is above reproach. And, and so they don't want that fight uh, because it would just expose everything, which would which could very well re result in a in a revolt in the United States, which they uh, they're probably prepared for it. But they really don't want that thing to play out over the BBC <laughs> evening news Um as they because they'd have to call the, they'd have to call in the national guard it they, you know if they're prepared to do it but they rather not do it it'd be january 6th on a herculean scale absolutely because i mean can i just say i mean let's let's you know consider what is being what is being alleged here i mean you you, you set it out you said it very clearly they bypassed congress i mean even if what they did you could find a legal defense to it it is still incredibly improper to bypass con con Congress. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert on the U.S. Constitution. I'd say this is borderline unconstitutional, and to do it for this kind of purpose, I'd say it was, you know, probably falls within the definition in the Constitution of a grave crime or misdemeanor, and we all know where mm -hmm. I'm heading. So yeah. consider we had gone, gone. No, I, was, I just wanted to say, can I can I share the screen real quick? Because Wilmer, you said yeah. extortion racket is what you yeah. is what you said. I just want to do a real quick screen share because I, I find this this article. Yeah. Oh, the NATO is an extortion racket. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, this is coming from RT, but it's quoting Stoltenberg what he said just today in some of his statements, mm -hmm. and so I mean, this is as reliable as it gets because this is coming straight from Stoltenberg. So let me just share this so we can get mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. thoughts. Can you see the, the screen, mm -hmm. guys? Mm -hmm. Everyone in the chat? Yeah. NATO to focus on undersea cables and pipelines. Stoltenberg vows to prevent and counter threats after Nord Stream expose blames, expose blames US and Norway. NATO will set up a new coordinating body to address threats to undersea infrastructure, Secretary General John Stoltenberg said on Monday. Here's a quote from Stoltenberg. Protection of critical undersea infrastructure will also be high on our agenda. The US-led bloc has been working on this for many years, Stoltenberg added, and we are now taking it to the next level. A new coordination cell will be established at NATO headquarters to map our vulnerabilities and engage with industry, which will support our efforts to prevent and counter threats to critical infrastructure, including undersea cables and pipelines, said Stoltenberg. And Stoltenberg, by the way, was also the Norwegian prime minister before taking over NATO. And finally, not one journalist, not one journalist in this press conference asked Stoltenberg about Hirsch's story. I just wanted to share that with you, uh, Wilmer mm -hmm. Alexander, and everyone yeah. in the uh, in the live stream. Because when you said extortion racket, I was just like, "This is this is the stuff of of mafias." It, this, it, I was trying not to invoke that term. I don't want the mafia coming after me, but because uh, <laughs> like Luca Brazzi, he sleeps with the fishes. But um, uh, and you know when they when when Stoltenberg talks about mm -hmm. undersea cables, Huawei owns a lot of the transatlantic cable. Uh, in, in, at least in terms of mm -hmm. a lot of the cables that have been recently laid, I'll say over the last 15 years or so, I think Huawei mm -hmm. owns a lot of those cables, or at least mm -hmm. was was the one that laid that cable. 
so it, it, how does how does the United States coordinate with China? Since Huawei is a Chinese company, mm-hmm. how does the United mm-hmm. States coordinate with Huawei if if they're mm-hmm. trying to quote unquote protect protect these cables? And you know this is this is nothing but extortion when when the mob comes to your business and says, "I need you to pay me five thousand dollars a month for fire protection." I'd hate to see <laughs> your business burn. Oh, and by the way. Uh, my man here with the match is the one that's going to burn it down. If you don't, I mean, this is, this is, this is gangsterism one on one. Absolutely, uh, the rest of the world has noticed. I mean, that's the other strange yeah. thing about this, because of course, um, again, I sent you um, editorials, all right, and they were from the Chinese media, but you know, mm-hmm. they set it all out. I, I understand it's also been covered extensively across the rest of the global south in india in latin america especially in africa nobody there by the way seems particularly surprised (laughs) the united states should be doing these kind of things but anyway they're aware of all of this so you know we are perhaps ourselves under the under the control of this protection racket if you can want to call it that way but others around the world can see it and of course, they're starting to draw their own conclusions. They're starting to take action. Yeah. They, they, they have drawn their conclusions. And again, look at the elections in the global south. Neoliberalism, uh, what, they, what they say, was birthed in Chile mm. and has now died in Chile. Uh, mm. Nicaragua, Brazil. Mm. I think Lula has said, I'm not getting involved in this U.S. Uh, Ukraine Russia conflict. Brazil is not going to get into this fight. Look at look at Bolivia. We, of course, we know uh, Venezuela. Venezuela and Colombia have reunited. Uh, that's just the global South. We know what the BRICS are doing. Brazil, Russia, India, China, and uh, oh, and South Africa. Uh, we now have joint naval operations taking place between South Africa, Russia, and I'm drawing a blank on who the third country was. Um, India. I think. In, thank you. India. Uh, India. You have look, look at the look at the de, look at mm-hmm. the design of the currency, the commodities based currency that mm-hmm. China and Russia and India are working on. So not only have these countries and of course we've got the relationship between China and Iran and in in uh, uh, and Russia uh, the shift the, the 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 Titanic is turning it just as you know a ship of that size it, it takes a little you can't turn it on a dime but this is done the cat's out the bag uh, you can't you know I could use all the all the euphemisms available Um the decisions have been made. The relationships, the strategic relationships are developing and the United States. And here's here's the, the unfortunate thing. One of the unfortunate things, you know, China along the way has asked the United States to participate. For example, on, de- on the development of 5G technology, China reached out to the United States 15 years ago and said, we're developing this technology. We'd like for you we, to work with us on its development. The United States said no. And so China said, well, we're going we're gonna to party with you. We're going to party without you. And so, the, so China went ahead and did it. And then the United mm. States wants to cry foul because, mm. you know. So uh, it's, it, it, what did Minister Farrakhan say? Never underestimate the blindness that attends arrogance. And this is mm. this is the unfortunate outcome. The arrogance of the United States um, has gotten the world to the brink of nuclear war. Hmm. Absolutely. Can I can I just go back to the media? Because, of course, we've discussed mm-hmm. that this is an immense situation and the media isn't reporting it. But, you know, let's take the protection racket analogy a little bit further. Is this omerta? Is it that they're all keeping silent because, you know, they're part of this thing? Or is it that they are themselves the target 
of the same kind of racket? Or is it a bit of both? Or is it something else? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I would strongly suggest that people watch the film The Godfather because you mentioned Omerta and mm. the, the, the Code of Silence. And, mm. you know, what happened as uh, the drug trade grew in the film and the Corleone family wanted to stay out of the drug business and the other five families wanted to get into the drug business. So if you look at uh, the Corleone family, the analogy there would be the United States and the other five families would be Europe. In just for, in, in terms of this analogy, the other five families are, are coming to the realization that this relationship has fallen apart. What did they say to the Don? Our problem with you is you have all of these senators and congressmen in your that you keep in your pocket like coins and you won't share the wealth. Well, mm. what we're find what I think what a lot of European countries are finding out is the United States is extracting all of their resources. Mm. And they are now left in the cold. They are being deindustrialized de mm. and they're hungry. So mm. the folks are in the street, what, a, two or three days before the United States blew up Nord Stream, the Germans, were, German people were in the street saying, turn up Nord Stream, turn up Nord Stream. They were, there were like 100,000 people in the street in Berlin screaming turn up Nord Stream and what does the United States do it blows it up so uh I I think again I think the tide is turning um Schultz in Germany Macron in France they're looking mm -hmm. at this and they're saying our days are numbered um if we if we keep following the United States down this rabbit hole there are no rabbits down there mm. Mm. Absolutely. Gosh. <laughs> but in order to rebel against the dawn, <laughs> you mm -hmm. need to find so you need to find some sort of, you know, well, I, 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 I could find some sort of stronger words, but you need to find your courage. <laughs> do right. Western leaders, do European leaders have the courage? Does the media in the United States have the courage? I mean, I am old enough. I'm talking go, going to go back to the media. I mean, I can remember Watergate. I'm sure you can. I can remember Watergate. That was all about a burglary, <laughs> ultimately, in the mm. offices of the Democratic Party. Somebody went in, tried to put uh, microphones in some of the phones. They were caught by the police. Uh, the president rather clumsily put together some kind of a cover, cover up. That was a massive, massive crisis in the United States. We have an allegation from one of the same journalists who reported Watergate, who exposed Watergate, by the way. Hirsch was absolutely involved mm -hmm. in all of that. I remember it. The same journalist comes along, says the president of the United States and his team, they plotted together to blow up the energy infrastructure of one of our leading allies, uh, uh, risking all kinds of incredible consequences of the world economy, possibly an armed clash with our major enemy, and they bypassed Congress to do it. And no one in the media wants to pursue this thing. I mean, th the contrast is, is, is remarkable. So, you know, if it's not Omarta, if they're afraid to pursue this story, if European leaders are afraid to act independently, how are we going to break away? How, how do we end shows this like thing? this? I mean, you know, yeah. Show, no. Shows like this. See, mm -hmm. you you mentioned it. it, it, it uh, Cy Hirsch is is the is the perfect uh, demonstration of his style of journalism has remained consistent. What has changed is journalism. It's no longer journalism. It's no longer independent. It's no longer unbiased. It's no longer about the story. It's about the narrative. Mm -hmm. And so what happened with Watergate, you still had some elements of an independent media. But now it has moved from journalism to 
uh, what are uh, arts and entertainment. It is it is a uh, uh, it is more discussions about what happened at the Grammy Awards than what happened with the Nord Stream pipeline, and so uh, we find ourselves now. It's an even greater uphill battle because the media wasn't totally independent when Psy was reporting on Watergate, but it was more independent than it is today. Um, so again, it's no longer about the facts and the story. It's about uh, NBC being the stenographer for the intelligence state. In fact, there was a story. Uh, let me see if I can if I can just quickly pull this up. Uh, there was a story in NBC. Uh, this was on um, April 6th. In a break with the past, U.S. is using intel to fight an info war with Russia, even when the intel isn't rock solid. It doesn't have to be solid intelligence, one U.S. official said. It's more important to get out ahead of them, the Russians, Putin specifically, before they do something. So mm -hmm. what that headline, is, and that's an NBC headline. What mm -hmm. they say in the story is, we are lying to you. Mm -hmm. That's what the story says. NBC mm -hmm. says, we are lying to you. But it's the noble lie. We're lying to you because Russia is lying to you. And so we have to tell our lie before they tell their lie to offset their lie. When NBC admits that, game over. It's done. Yeah. Hmm. Let's just... just turn quickly back to the geopolitics of this because I, I mean this is to me is ultimately the single most important thing now you know if you have a, a gangster in the neighborhood you know in the near in the near, near you know nearby you don't want the gangster expanding his tentacles into your neighborhood you try <laughs> to keep him away and to the extent that the president Joe Biden, in his State of the Union address, was talking about um, foreign policy. He was again talking about, you know, this great epic conflict between democracies and autocracies. But we've seen evidence, let's just call it evidence, because, you know, nobody's investigating Cy Hearst's story, Jersey story. I believe it to be true. But, but let's call it evidence that the president actually heads a gangsterish <laughs> administration. Why does he assume in that case that anybody around the world is going to be attracted is to this? Why does why does he think that people will be wanting to side with him <laughs> and wanted to invite him, if you like, into their neighborhood? I think we have to draw a distinction between gangsters versus mm. hoodlums. Mm. And the United States is a hoodlum. Yeah. And, 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 and I'll say this to make the point, I am not calling President Xi a gangster and I'm not calling Putin a gangster, but in the context of these analogies, they're gangsters. Uh, a dear, dear friend of mine, Tom Porter says, once you learn how to play the game, then you have to learn how the game gets played. And so the United States is thinking that it's a gangster, but it's really just a common hoodlum. And the real gangsters uh, have come to the forefront. For example, uh, this whole issue with Russian oil and the cap that 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 uh, Janet Yellen was talking about putting on Russian oil. And that was just utterly foolish. But what does Russia now say? Oh, we're going to cut back on production. We're going to we're going to force the price up by cutting back on production, leaving the United States crashing, scratching its head saying, wow, we didn't expect you guys to do that. The, the Russian ruble is supposed to have been crushed, is supposed to have been declined. The Russian economy was supposed to have collapsed and Putin is now supposed to be, you know, trying to find sanctuary in some foreign country. 
didn't quite happen that way, Joe Biden, because you're a hoodlum messing with a gangster. You know, it just reminds me of my dad sitting in his chair reading the paper and I come in with some crazy idea and he looks over his paper and says, son, do you think you really want to do that? And then he just puts the paper back up and leaves me standing there going, no, dad, I think I'm going to change my idea. Because if you keep on your way, you're going to have to find a new place to live. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, my dad was a stone cold gangster, as I'm thinking, I'm a gangster, but I'm just merely a hoodlum. So mm -hmm. <laughs> the, Uni the United States, well, the sun never set on the British Empire once upon a mm -hmm. time. Now it has. Mm. This is the way that empires go. Mm. It happened in Rome. It happened mm. in Egypt. We still have the pyramids we can go see. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, the sun has set mm. on the American empire. And mm. the, it, it, it is, the American empire is still trying to impose. It was a gangster once upon a time, but... Uh, the dynamics on the block have changed. Uh, there are new gangsters on the block and it's not working. I have to say, I'm going to say it actually so to that. I mean, you one, one of the most interesting Putin films are those interviews he did with Oliver North. And there's mm. one particularly very, very interesting section. Oliver Stone, Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone, uh, Oliver Stone. Oh, Oliver Stone. Ooh, that would be, but wouldn't that Oliver, be an Oliver interesting North. conversation? <laughs> yeah, Oliver North. Very <laughs> <laughs> Oliver Stone. You're absolutely right. Thank, thanks. I stand corrected there. But anyway, but he had a very interesting exchange with Oliver Stone, in which he was saying, you know, I understand how the world works. He was talking about how things happen. He clearly understood. He made it absolutely mm -hmm. clear that he understood all the points that you are making very, very well indeed. He was completely frank and open about the extent of his unsentimental, tough-minded realism about the kind of people he was having to deal with. There was actually, I find a most revealing in interview, actually. The single most revealing part of what was already altogether a very revealing programme, which has never had the attention or, or, or the publicity or the circulation that it deserves. So I, I completely agree. And of course, what Putin thinks and what the Chinese think, I'm sure, is the same. And they talk to each other all the time and they exchange views. And Putin talks to Modi. And my impression is that Modi has come to bear much the same views about the people he's dealing with in the United States also. So... I think the world in general has a pretty clear picture of the kind of people it's dealing with in Washington. And those articles I showed you from the Global Times mm -hmm. about Nord Stream, which, of course, they have covered. They're covering it, as I said, extensively. They, they are aware of what's going on. And, of course, they make exactly some of the very same points that we've been making on this program. They say, you know, if this was untrue, wouldn't there be far more convincing denials? Wouldn't this be given the kind of coverage so that it can be refuted? It can't be refuted because Cy Hirsch, Cy Hirsch is telling yeah. the truth. Yeah. Uh, you know, you said that Russia and China talk and they agree. Yeah. I, I would venture to guess that there are a lot of things that they disagree on. Yeah, that's true. But... Both of them have are operating from a common understanding and a common and a mutual respect, mm -hmm. saying, look, what I'm doing in Russia works in Russia. You have to do what you have to do in China because China is different. Do you. I'm going to do me and let's work together for our for our mutual interest, which tends to be more uh, uh Business related and economy and economics generated than 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 militaristic, um, so you know and, and see that's the point that the United States just doesn't seem to get, and for me evidence of that is when the Chinese met with Blinken in Anchorage, Alaska, uh, and 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 the Chinese got up and walked out and said we're not going to sit here and let you talk to us like this you're. 
No, you're not going to disrespect us like this. You're not going to tell us what to do. Damn it, we're China. And, you know, by the way, we hold, what, two, three trillion dollars of your debt? I mean, we, <laughs> we own your banks. You can't talk to us like this. And you mentioned uh, the, the interview that Putin did. I, I would say folks need to go back and listen to the Valdai speech. Yeah. And and what was that? Th- was that four hours long? Mm. Basically, with it was extemporaneous. Most of it was. Mm. Mm. Uh, compare that with what we saw on the State of the Union. Joe Biden yeah. basically struggling to get through a teleprompter. Um, you know, pea shooter at a gunfight. Yeah. And 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 final point. The. Um, the uh, the Grammy Awards and this whole thing, I think it was Sam Smith dressed as Satan parading around. What did Vladimir Putin say? In our culture, we have standards. <laughs> there are certain things that we are not going to allow. And you all in the West, you do what you want to do, but we're not going there. There are certain yeah. things. I saw that and was just utterly disgusted yeah. that... Yeah mainstream American television would allow a horrific display of that nature Mm. into the living rooms of Americans. And we call Mm. that progress. We call that left. Mm. Putin said, no, we're not, we don't do that in this country. Uh, Mm. We have standards. We have culture. Mm. Absolutely. A lot to be said for that, indeed. Wilma, I think we've gone on for 56 minutes. I mean, oh, okay. I, 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 I'm going to ask you if, if there's you know, things you particularly want yourself to say, because I've asked questions. I mean, I think we've, you've covered very, very well my points. Um, but perhaps you have some things to add, and then maybe we can, we, we can move on to Alex. Uh, I would just very simply say those that have not read the Cy Hirsch story need to read it and you need to read it more than once um and that in my humblest in my humble opinion and all the issues that surround that story as to why it hasn't gotten greater attention why isn't it being discussed in mainstream media why aren't any of the journalists in the white house briefings demanding that this issue be, be be spoken to that right there speaks volumes the fact that they're the, the the members of the press corps are so concerned with access that they don't give a damn about the story because 10 of them should should have said you know what you ask the first question when they ignore you I'm going to ask the second question when they ignore me. You ask the third question. It's all going to be centered around Cy Hirsch. And we're going to force the administration to speak to the issue. There are power. There's supposed to be power in numbers. They outnumber the press secretary, but they're conspicuously silent. Their silence is deafening. So that's the point that I would leave this is yeah. read that Cy Hirsch story a couple of times. Yeah. The greatest story the media has been handed for 40 years and they're not touching it. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Alex. Uh, let's do some questions. Is that all right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you know about the rally in DC on Sunday, the rage against the war machine? Thank you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I think it's not only going to be in Washington, it's, there are going to be other cities involved as well. Uh, I know uh, on the uh, in the D.C. rally, I think uh, Scott Ritter is speaking. Um, um, uh, what's your name from Code Pink, I believe, is 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 speaking. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm no insult or no disrespect. I'm just drawing a blank uh, on her M- name. Medea, M- Medea Benjamin. Medea Benjamin. Benjamin. Love you, Medea. Sorry about that. Uh, Medea Benjamin is speaking. Uh, there are a number of folks. Garland Nixon is going to be speaking. A number of folks uh, are going. I'll be in attendance. I am not going to be uh, be speaking. But uh, yes, it, it it'll be interesting to see 
the turnout, and particularly because I think we're supposed to have good weather on Sunday, um, the turnout of that for that for that rally. Uh, I think Ray McGovern is. I don't know if Ray's going to be there or not, but but um, Max Blumenthal is going to be speaking. So, yeah, good turnout. Watch Jimmy Dore. There are a lot of a lot of big names. Um, from Michael, anyone else think that the USA train crashes are from cost cutting and affecting over working people or an outside power or both? The train crashes. I have no evidence. Uh, I can't say no. Uh, what I because I don't know. I have no evidence to support that. I know that these types of accidents happen more than people realize. Uh, it could be due to lack of maintenance on the rails. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, I don't have any evidence. So I, like Cy Hirsch, I only speak when I do. And um, um, mm -hmm. so I, I, I have to leave it there. Neurosurgery. Can I just say, can, can I, can, yeah. can, can I just say quickly yeah, about that? Because I've, I've seen the, the railway systems in China and, mm -hmm. you know, they're a wonder of the world. <laughs> Whatever you may think about China and how it works. I mean, they they can do this sort of thing. And, you know, over, there was one big accident some years ago. But overall, the safety record there is extraordinary. Mm hmm. All right. Neurosurgery Highland says, again, this story proves that this is calculated chaos to bring about a deep crisis to hide the fact that the West financial economy is hollowed. They will extract the wealth order out of chaos. War is wished. Which story is neurosurgery referring to? Uh, the uh, the Nord Stream, I imagine. Story. Yeah, the Hirsch. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. oh, the Nord Stream sabotage, I guess. Mm. Or I imagine it carries over to the to what's going on in Ohio as well. All of these things. Well, you know, it's important with that, with the Nord Stream story, as Cy Hirsch reports it, is that Joe Biden really responded to pressure from, uh, what's his, Ted Cruz, yeah, Ted Cruz in Texas, that um, initially, from the way I think Cy reported it, there was, there was some um, reluctance within the administration to carry out this exercise, but pressure from the right, specifically Ted Cruz, is what to a great degree pushed the um, pushed the decision over the edge. Sparky says, "Is there an attempt to hold them accountable?" Newland and her gang of thugs can just say they were just following the president's orders. <laughs> I don't see an attempt to hold any of them accountable because there's no real outcry from the from from Americans because they really don't understand what's going on. Uh, it's still considered in the minds of many to be a conspiracy theory. Oh, there you go with the conspiracy theory. Just because it's, it's a conspiracy theory. First of all, I think that's a CIA developed term. Uh, but just because it's a conspiracy theory doesn't mean it's wrong. Uh, <laughs> so, but but there's no there's no common outcry here because folks, a lot of folks just don't. They still think that RussiaGate is viable. Yeah. Uh, J. H. Scott says Dr. Leon is right about the press needing to repeat the question when ignored. But they are either stenographers mm -hmm. or the government, or only care about access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be thrown out of the press corps. Yep. They want to be able to travel with the president. Exactly. Dominique says, don't you think that this insane idea of war with China is more due to the fear of an alternative currency to the dollar than to Taiwan? Yes, I believe Taiwan is the uh, excuse, not the cause. I think that there are different factions within the uh, Western elite that uh, some some are some uh, in the Biden administration follow the Brzezinski mindset in terms of Russia is the enemy, and then you have others from I think more of the industrial side that believe that China is the enemy. And they are struggling and vying and jockeying for position. Um, but I, but I, I believe that uh, Taiwan is merely 
the excuse that the United States is using to try to bait China into a response. But again, as Sun Tzu said, the successful warrior wins the battle before it's fought. And the United States is really messing with the wrong guy on this one. Hmm. A different perspective says, also asked G. Nixon, this is foreign civil asset seizure ending and demilitarization of the West. Can the U.S. still occupy countries without the dollar? Wow, that's an interesting question. I don't understand the first part of it. Uh, the, one of the major focuses of China, the, uh, Russia, uh, it is to move off of the dollar. But with the military prowess of the United States, it can still occupy countries based upon its military, but now it has to be much more selective in the countries that it attacks because of resistance from, from its adversaries. And I'm not going to say enemies, I'm going to say adversaries, because I don't think that China and Russia are enemies. They are merely responding to aggression by the United States. The United States is their enemy. I don't see them as being our enemy. They're our adversaries. Exactly. Sparky says, I wrote, if there were an attempt, not is there an attempt. Sorry, Sparky, oh. I must have read it wrong. Okay. Uh, let's see. Salty Pretzel says, Dr. Leon, it doesn't matter if there is an outcry from the people. The government does what they want, regardless of what the citizens want. As a political scientist, I can't subscribe to that because the government is the um, operational manifestation of the will of the people. I do realize that, uh, particularly in this country, that it has been taken over. Well, it was founded by elites. It has been controlled by the elite. But that, to me, is a very defeatist, defeatist attitude. I'm not willing to succeed that point. Uh, I'm going down fighting. And if that's foolish on my behalf, well, then that's mm. foolish on my behalf. Um, I, in terms of being an African-American, I remember one time being with my dad and, and somebody said, this is the white man's country. And my father said, oh, hell no. I will never, ever resign to that fact. We're going to fight this thing out until the last dog dies. So um, that's that's my response to that. From uh, Jeffrey Brown. Yeah, let's see here. What do you think if what do you think if the psychos in Ukraine started after the people they really hate even more than the Russians, Poles, Hungarians, uh, blacks, etc. And we start to see their real colors. I know several countries, one in particular that is preparing for this eventuality is the USA prepared i guess so what what happens if the the forces in ukraine start really going after i don't know how much more after they can go uh, mm -hmm. based on what they've been doing in the donbass since 2014 um mm -hmm. i i don't i i would need a little more uh a little more clarification on what that means because they've been engaged in genocide since 2014 so um mm -hmm. I don't know what else they, how much further they can go. Mm -hmm. Okay, Je Jeffrey Brown says, I have a theory based on life experience of um, the first part to this question, actually, that I missed. I have a theory based on life experience contacts and a question. Let's say that the anti-Russian pogroms have played well in Europe and the USA, but are fading in the public mind and have started to lose the attention of the Western media. Even Nord Stream doesn't seem to enervate the situation either way to the extent that the Zelensky regime would expect. I, you know, it would take me a little while to think through that one. Uh, I'm so focused on the realities that the hypotheticals, I got to shift gears, maybe go to another, another hard drive. And <laughs> uh, I mean, no disrespect to the question. I, I just, um, I, I'm really focused on the reality, not the hypothetical. Marcos588588 says the point about Biden crowing his 
pro-worker ideals, but then siding with industry is tied to the railway issue. Labor action was brewing in late 2022. Automation, neglect, and ineptitude led to this. And greed. And greed. Because when you when you look at how much the railways are making, and when you when you I mean the just the the the, the billions of dollars that they're making. And just their total, rel they didn't want to give a day, one day of vacation, mm -hmm. one day of vacation. And Joe Biden gets how many days of vacation? Congress gets how many days of vacation? Mm -hmm. The quality of health care that Joe Biden has, quality of health care that, that members of Congress have. Why are they so unwilling to provide to the American people the very same things that they are being given by the American people because Joe Biden's salary and health care comes out of our tax dollars. Congress's salary and health care comes out of our tax dollars. So why should we provide the best quality of care for them and they don't want to give one day mm. of sick leave to rail workers. Mm. Very true. Uh, B456XZ says, there's a report in the Business Insider that claims that the U.S. is actually shooting down their own research balloons. Total hysteria. I read that. That's mm. interesting coming from the Business Insider, <laughs> if you understand who owns the Business Insider yeah. and what they're all about. But to that point... I did read yesterday that mm -hmm. what uh, some scientists have done is they have retraced the flight of the balloon based upon understanding the direction of the jet stream. And what they have come to find out is one or two of these balloons actually were launched from U.S. weather stations. So mm -hmm. I have read and heard that there is some validity to that to that statement. And, you know, into that, just really quickly, I find it very interesting in, in watching mainstream Western media here. They still <laughs> refer to that first balloon as a spy balloon. <laughs> they still call it. Uh, I was uh, um, Andrea. What's her name from from NBC? Um, oh, uh, Mitchell. Mi Andrea right? Mitchell yeah. said yeah. last night on on the news last night, the Chinese spy balloon. It was a weather balloon, folks. It was spying on the weather. <laughs> Sorry. The, the Russian invasion was unprovoked. <laughs> unprovoked. Right. Oh, and, and there as, were as weapons long as it of, takes. There were weapons of there mass destruction. Mass destruction, yeah. <laughs> as long as it takes. As long as it takes. Yeah, they, they've got oh, some lines, which are standard. And don't forget, Saddam mm -hmm. was really good friends with, um, what's his name, in the Tora Bora cave. Saddam was saying, oh, with, uh, with Bin Laden. Uh, Ozzam, Ozzam, yeah. Ozzam they, they were golfing. They were golfing buddies, and they used to play <laughs> golf regularly at uh, at the Masters. Yeah, <laughs> I'm looking at the chat. It says yellow cake in the uh, oh balloons. yellow cake. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well said. Uh, let's see. We'll do a couple of more, and we'll wrap it up here. Uh, let's see. Dan says this war is not different than the Roman Empire seeking to wipe Carthage mm -hmm. off the face of Earth. Neocons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are all just Cato and Cato the censor reincarnated? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I I would yeah. not dis disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Uh, K H Sauce says Dr. Wilmer Leon spot on culturally from Young Putin and oh, G. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, from four five six T one two three G says the USA must retake their government by begging men of the doctor's caliber to run for office. <laughs> <laughs> You're very kind, but nah. You, <laughs> no, uh, unlike Bill Clinton, I did inhale. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Uh, Rafiq Adams says chutzpah is the appropriate word. And mm, Roman yeah. V asks, what risks for Norway regarding the North Stream situation? No. You know, uh, can I can I add on to that question? People talk about Norway. Well, not many people are talking about Norway. But yeah. from what I understand from uh, the Hirsch article, Sweden and Denmark were also involved. And yeah. I believe Nord Stream is not just Russia or Germany. I believe that Nord Stream 1 is owned by 
Netherlands, Austria. I mean, there's there's quite a lot Austria, of EU Austria. countries that are invested in the whole Nord mm. Stream project. Austria was I, heavily I would, involved. I would refer yeah. to you two on that one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what happens? I mean, for me, how come no one's talking about these countries? What's, well, indeed. I mean, well, indeed. <laughs> for for me, for me, the story about Norway actually is it just goes to prove that ambition can creep as well as crawl. Frankly, I mean, they were in it for all kinds of reasons, but I suspect money played a very, very mm -hmm. big part on it. And you know, listening to Stoltenberg talking about you know the rights of small countries and you know democracy and all of that. And you know that Norway, which is, of course, he's Norwegian and he's a member, I believe, of the ruling party in Norway. And he was a former prime minister of Norway, listening to all this windy rhetoric that comes from him and looking at this all grubby behavior that Norway got involved in in this. I mean, it really, really does make one feel, frankly, you know, well, I, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to try and search for a word. It would be too strong. Mm -hmm. uh, right, let me let me let me add. Yeah. I, I would I I have a question uh, for for mm. Cy Hirsch if, if he's watching, mm. and that would be, if I understand the geography, Nord Stream Two bypasses Ukraine, mm. which means the transit fees that Ukraine was receiving from Nord Stream One. No. would not be paid to Ukraine through Nord Stream 2. Right. Which means Ukraine is losing a lot of revenue from Nord Stream that if Nord Stream 2 were turned up. Yeah. Joe Biden was the commissar of Ukraine. Yeah. So does Joe Biden have any fight or Victoria Nuland or any of that ilk? What's their financial interest is their financial interest i don't know the answer to that question but i would think that question needs to be asked yes i mean Wilbur, you're absolutely right on all on all the essential points i mean before uh, the Nord Stream pipelines were built gas flowed to europe from russia across ukraine because the pipelines were built by the soviet union ukraine was part of the soviet union it was the quickest fastest way to send gas from Western Siberia from the gas fields in Western Siberia. The Soviets built the pipelines across Ukraine and they came to Germany. And I can remember, by the way, back in the 1980s, the United States, when those pipelines were built, was very unhappy about it. But just to clarify, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 both go through the Baltic Sea. They do not go right. through Ukraine. So Balt Nord Stream oh. 1 was the first pipeline built after 2000, which okay. bypassed Ukraine. That was oh, negotiated okay. Okay. by the Germans and the Russians because they were unhappy with paying transit fees to Ukraine and having Ukraine yeah. siphoning off the gas. And then Ukraine was very unhappy about Nord Stream 1. And then Germany came along and said, let's also build another pipeline, Nord Stream you. 2, which would have cut Ukraine out essentially entirely. Of course, the Ukrainians weren't having that. So that, that's the story. So this, there's two pipelines, Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2. Nord Stream 2 was the, going to be the bigger one, and mm -hmm. it was going to be the one that was, would complete this transfer of the gas from passing through Ukraine. Can, yeah, can I speak to this Newsweek published article? About yeah, I have that on there, yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the things that I always say to my students is the first thing you got to do is ask yourself, does the story make sense? When, when, you, when you read a story like China sent a spy balloon over here, does that make sense? When China has satellites in low Earth orbit that can read license plates on cars, when they are broadcasting sending pictures from the dark side of the moon when china has a moon rover that has now been running i think five years longer than they expected it would there it they have their own space station when the united states kicked them out of the space mm -hmm. program so they've got all this technology hypersonic missiles now they're into 6g technology and they're going to spy on the United States with a, with a balloon? 
it, it, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Well, it's, now it's not only one balloon. <laughs> It's four oh. balloons. Oh, or, now, or oh objects. That, objects. That, that changes the whole. Yeah, one's the size of a car, of a small car. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh man, let's see here. Who knew all it took was a few balloons to make vaccine sudden deaths and Biden crime family drama disappear from the headlines? Mm -hmm. Is out there. Mm -hmm. There was a question here about Japan. Different perspective says, how long will Japan still pay for the U.S. debt and troops? Well, it's a very good question. I mean, the one thing I would say about Japan is that they're being very, very careful about the sanctions against Russia that they <laughs> enforce and those that they don't. They've been much more successful than the Germans to protect their own energy trade with, with Russia. So they still import oil from Russia. They still import gas from Russia. They've managed to carve out exemptions for Sakhalin, for the Sakhalin uh, um, infrastructure where they're still heavily invested. So the Japanese have played a more skillful game, much more skillful than the Germans have done. Now, of course, they've got all sorts of other issues. They've, mm -hmm. They're in a major quarrel with the uh, Chinese, which is deteriorating as far as I can see. They've got issues with South Korea as well, by the way, which is another story. But uh, on relations with Russia, the Chinese, the Japanese Prime Minister Kishida was still saying that Japan wanted a peace treaty with Russia. And he said it just a few days ago. So it's quite interesting. They are walking a very fine line. They are yeah. so far have been doing a fairly good job at, yeah. at the Philippines as well. Not only yes. uh, not only the, the Japanese, but but Marcos Jr. in the Philippines is finding himself having to walk a similar line. And um It'll be it'll be very interesting to see over the next few months as the United States tries to turn up the pressure on them to pick a side, pick a team, which way they which way they decide to go. Yeah. Fran Brown says in this post truth world, government can inform citizens of anything it believes is true. Nord Stream balloons, Ohio chemical spills. None of it has happened because the government says so. We are not in a post-truth world because you are watching this show and we are yeah. speaking the truth yes well said Rafik Adams says I'm curious about the status of the Nord Stream insurance claim which would be based on facts it's billions in payout or coverage some insurance. somebody was bound to somebody was bound to ask that question <laughs> um I, I I am it will be very intriguing because um if it's pursued and, you know, there's lots of companies which might want to pursue it, lots of investors of those companies who might want to see it pursued. And it does go to court. Well, there is this concept of discovery, disclosure. And, of course, um, you know, the, the, the Seymour Hersh story is out there. Perhaps, um, you know, courts might be prevailed upon to ask for documents to be produced and evidence to be produced and things of that kind to be produced. And that could it, the, that could eventually lead to all sorts of, shall we say, interesting results. But I, I'm not going to go into the details of this because I don't know the details of all of these policies. I don't know exactly how they work. There's always the problem of, are the courts themselves prepared to go there? We have to you know, bear all that in mind. But it's certainly something to keep in mind and see what happens. I, I wrote down the word jurisdiction. Uh, mm. the, one of the questions for in terms of insurance claims would be, uh, what's the who has jurisdiction in this? Yeah. Because we know if if these uh, suits or claims were brought in U.S. courts, uh, yeah. no, not one dime will be paid uh, in, in foreign courts. What courts does the United States recognize? Yes. What courts does yeah. it not? Um, well, I don't know the answer to those questions, like you just said, uh, Alexander. Yeah. I don't know the answers to those questions, but I think those are questions that need to be asked. Yeah, they're very good questions. Now, the most likely jurisdiction is England, 
because okay. England has historically been the centre of the world insurance industry. And I would have thought there's a high probability. We've got, of course, our own oil and gas industries. So we've probably got quite a lot of experience here insuring pipelines and mm. that kind of thing. And, okay. well, basically, we invented modern insurance and insurance markets have been historically set up here. So, uh, you know, most likely it is England. Another strong possibility is it's Sweden. Sweden has a very strong tradition in commercial courts. Um, it could be a combination of the two. I don't know. But I would have guessed it would be one of those two jurisdictions. Now, you know, the English courts historically have been fairly independent. Not that's to true. anything like the don't, same don't say, extent. Don't say that to recently, Julian Assange, exa yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But anyway, we'll yeah. see. But I mean, bear in mind, these would be commercial courts. So different from a different branch, completely different branch of the high court than the one that's been dealing with the Assange case. But having said that, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, say, you know, it's you know, p politics wouldn't play a role. Of course they would. Mm -hmm. If you want me to give a more pertinent example of the British courts behaving in a way that I find, I find strange, it was the High Court's decision and the Court of Appeals decision to uphold the British government's seizure of Venezuela's gold. Mm. I mean, because, you know, mm. Guaido, you know, uh, was right. the right, true president of Venezuela. I mean, I find that a most odd decision. But there we go. We know, we'll just have to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have time for a couple of more, Wilmer? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, let's do a couple more. Sparky says, uh, didn't Norway have their own pipeline ready to go online when they blew up Nord Stream 2 yet? I believe they did. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's an amazing coincidence, of course. Yeah. <laughs> it's part of that. I'm a I, I am a junior high school teacher and literally have two students age 13, 17, have heart attacks this week. I know it's anecdotal, but I feel depressed and helpless that way, that the war in Polk is no longer even being talked about. Sorry about that, Sparty, but um, it is it is being talked about still. Yes. I, mean, yes. I think it still is yes. front, front and center news. And context yes. in this is it's it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to talk about it in its proper context. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is one the lack of context is one of the things that causes so much stress. Yeah, yeah, absolutely correct. All I can see is the U.S. and Norway commit a terror act against European countries and everyone mm -hmm. tries to hide it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said, Dimitra. And Marcos 58 says, interesting Punic War analogy, but this is more an ailing Western Roman Empire trying to humble a tenacious, energetic, and able enemy. Not happening. I would just, again, yeah. take, take uh, um, issue with the word uh, enemy. Yeah. 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 Very true. And to wrap it up, let's take this last one from Arctic Lord, who says, at Durant, do you ever have a show discussing the rights that the Russian people have lost since the beginning of this conflict, i.e. the freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom to protest? What do you think of that, Wilmer, the fact that Russians have lost so many rights and have been demonized uh, well, collectively? The, the West has demonized Russia. I don't know that, uh, that they have lost freedom of the press. Mm. I talk to I talk to West uh, I talk to to Russian no. journalists all the time, mm. and they speak very freely and very openly. Uh, mm. I would also then balance that losing of freedom of the press with the Twitter FBI story. You see, to me, when someone brings up that point, to me, implicit in that is they are comparing that to what is supposed to be a free press in the United States. And mm -hmm. we don't have a free press in the United mm -hmm. States. Just follow Matt Taibbi's uh, reporting on the Twitter gate and the FBI trying to pressure Twitter to manage the narrative, mm -hmm. uh, the anti-Russian narrative, which has fallen apart. So mm -hmm. I'm not really sure where all of that is in 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 that question I, I i don't know i need i would need the person asking the question to provide some evidence to support the position then i'd be in a better position to discuss it 
Yeah, um, can I just say to this, yep. can I just quickly say to this, on, on Saturday, as it happens, I hosted a friend of mine who is Russian and is a very, very strong opponent of President Putin's. I mean, he's one of these people who is very strongly opposed to President Putin. And he's had a very complicated journeys backwards and forwards from Russia. But he basically says exactly what Wilner is saying, which is that, yes, oh, okay. there's been some sort of you know limits on the way news is circulated in Russia, but journalists still do their work. They can criticize the war. Rock bands criticize the war. Protests take place. And it's much, much easier to do all of those things in Russia than it is here. I mean, mm. here in Britain, and I want to say this, there's been an attempt to set up a protest in London, an anti-war protest, as we would call it, as people in Britain would call it. In other words, an, a, a protest trying to oppose British support for weapons being sent to Ukraine. And it has found it almost impossible to set up a venue I mean, whenever one venue is set up, the, there are so many threats and so much uh, uh, pressure on that particular venue that it has. It, 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 it's, I, I know of at least two cancellations that have happened one after the other. That's happening in London, and notice these are these are. Well, I've seen some of the bits of the emails. Some of the pressure is incredibly forceful and i would say of a sort that law enforcement should take an interest in and as i understand it it is refusing to do so which is really quite remarkable <laughs> so we do have the war the rage against the war machine once again dc this sunday yeah. february yeah. 19th and Harry says 100 plus companies from 12 countries invested in built Nord Stream okay. 2. 100 companies. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right. So we will uh, leave it there. Thank you very, very much to everyone that joined us on this live stream on Rockfin, Odyssey, Rumble, the Duran.locals.com, YouTube. Thank you to our moderators, Zarael, Reckless Abandon. And who else? I believe Peter is also with us moderating and Alice in Blunderland. Great to have you all here moderating and helping us out. And a very special thank you to the one and only, the great Wilmer Leon. I have your Twitter account in the description down below. I have your great. website with great. your book as well. You link to your book as well down below in the description. Thank and you. I will also and it's back there over my show. Back there over my over my shoulder, back there somewhere. <laughs> All right. So definitely check out Wilmer's website. Check out his Twitter account. Follow him on Twitter. I will have that as a pinned comment as well. Thank down you. Below. And I'm losing my voice. And thank you to Alexander McCurris, the Oracle of London. Thank you, everybody. Have a great uh, morning, evening, or night, wherever you are in the world. Mm -hmm.